merci beaucoup euh, au Centre Pompidou, à Catherine Ware, Caroline Ferreira, Charlène Dinou, euh, Ilara Conti, Elie Butros et Jean-Max Collard pour euh, cette invitation. Et merci aux invités, donc euh, Nikita Dawan, Arvin Naren, Grant Watson pour être ici euh, aujourd'hui. Donc je suis Grégory Castera, je suis co-directeur de, de Council et aujourd'hui je vais parler au nom de cette organisation. Euh, il y a aussi dans, les, dans la salle différentes personnes de l'équipe, Sandra Tergeman, co-directrice, Julia Tonion et Antonia, Antonin Charré. Et la table ronde sera modérée par euh, Emma Ariola, qui est euh, éditeur en chef du, euh, du journal Contre Nature. Euh, donc avant d'introduire la table ronde, je vais rapidement présenter Council assez vite, parler de l'histoire et du format du, du journal ainsi que de ses, de ses enjeux. Et euh, vu que les participants parlent en anglais, je vais faire cette drôle d'exercice de parler anglais en étant français. Donc euh, voilà. Et, euh, et donc pour ceux qui ne parlent pas bien anglais, je vous conseille peut-être de vous mettre en groupe et de trouver quelqu'un qui, qui peut traduire peut-être. J'espère que vous parlez tous anglais. Voilà. Mais euh, c'était annoncé ainsi. So, traditionally a council is a group of people who gather to take decisions for both themselves and for those they represent. Councils operate across culture and at many levels of society, including families, trade unions, corporation governments, and religious communities. And as a non-for-profit organization, our council is the name of our organization, we assemble people and knowledge from the arts, science, civic society in order to foster new understanding of societal issues. We do this in different ways, and I will do, say it very briefly. So, most of our work today, to date has involved developing long-term inquiries that address political, social, and environmental issues. They generate workshop, performance, exhibitions, publications, and also artworks like this one, we will talk about it later, or this one, um, that we commissioned. Um, so today, the, hmm, <laughs> alongside this activity, we have established a fellowship to support artists and cultural producers who instigate social change. So, so far it has been awarded to eight individuals, dancer, photographer, designer, teacher, who actively engage in their social cultural context to share knowledge and prompt new perspective. So today we are, present, we are gathering for a discussion around the Against Nature Journal, which we are presenting for, uh, in this first edition of Cosmopolis. So, The concept of nature, so it's the Against Nature Journal, so it's about the concept of nature, it is still widely used to criminalize individuals for their sexual orientation and gender identity. The Against Nature or unnatural laws are grounded in colonial history and religious morality, and they appear today in the penal code of more than 50 countries. Based on recent cases supported by the NGO Legal Agenda in Beirut, the inquiry makes use of the space left for interpretation in the law to propose creative legal argumentation. As adheres to a secular legal system with a religious imprint, we are subject to the concept and figure of nature being used to criminalize individuals for non-reproductive sexual orientation, gender identity, and ways of being. The legal language to support such criminalization offers themes from colonial legal code, for instance, the Napoleonic Penal Code in France or the various British texts. So in some penal code, it, it, it is defined as act against nature, like in Lebanon in the Article 534, or canal intercourse against the order of nature, so it's the 7377 in India, we'll talk about it today, or carnal knowledge against the order of nature in Kenya, for instance. So this law often had no cultural translation when they were first introduced in former European colonies. So using this arbitrary concept to divide what is natural and unnatural 
politicians, judges, religious figures still ascribe to nature an undeniable source of authority, enforcing such division with the full coercive power of the state. Ultimately, the condemnation of the colonial origin of contra-natural laws is important, but insufficient. We bear responsibility for the continuing exercise of these laws in the present. This authority is arguably based on the religious morality. The, exp the expression personifies nature as a female figure, a nurturing mother, whose attributes are laws which impels anyone to obey her. It also refers to nature as a pure environment of chaotic forces separated from and, uh, and threatened by human actions. In both sense, nature's power is recognized and feared. In fact, the order of nature became a paradigm, a system of beliefs that creates an integrated and unified vision of the world, so convincing that people confuse it with reality. In depth to Laurent Daston and Fernando Vidal reader, The Moral Authority of Nature, the Against Nature Journal aims to question the authority of nature and to contribute to, I quote, shift the focus of inquiry from the existence of illegitimacy of nature's authority to its jurisdiction and working. Hmm. No, okay, we have a problem, technical problem, okay. So, in Lebanon, for example, there is no legal document that defines what against nature means with regard to the law. Recent cases in 2009 and 2014, supported by the Beirut-based social justice organization Legal Agenda, demonstrated that judges have the right to interpret the concept of nature in such ways as to dismiss accusation of same-sex relation and sodomy. In 2009, for example, Judge Munir Suleiman delivered the following verdict in a criminal case in which two men were accused of violating Article 534 of the Lebanese Penal Code. So, in this excerpt, it is a video we shoot in Beirut, and we ask the judge to read his verdict. And it's like the end of the verdict. We show, I should show one, a few seconds. <laughs> إذا كان الأمر متوك لتقدير القضاء فإننا نرى أن الإنسان لم يستطع بعد فهم قوانين الطبيعة بجوانبها كافة ولا يزال حتى اليوم يسعى لكشاف الطبيعة وطبيعته حتى وحيث السنن لما تقدم يكون مفهوم خلف الطبيعة مرتبط بذهنية المجتمع وبأعرافه ومدى تقبله لأنماط طبيعية جديدة غير معروفة منه أو غير مقبولة حيث أن الإنسان هو جزء من الطبيعة وأحد عناصرها وخلية داخل خلية فيها فلا يمكن القول أن أي ممارسة من ممارساته أو عن أي سلوك من سلوكه أنه مخالف للطبيعة حتى ولو كان سلوكا جرميا لأنها هي أحكام الطبيعة فإذا أمطرت سنة صيفا أو أو موجة حرارة حصلت شتاء أو أن شجرة أثمرت بغير ثمارها المعتادة على الناس فإنها تكون كلها وفقا لنظام الطبيعة وتبعا لأحكامها زي هي الطبيعة بحد ذاتها. So, as you see, the language of the judge shifts from a legal register to a more poetical one. This observation was instrumental in the conception of the Against Nature Journal. Beyond the possibility of this action to have a legal effect that actually judges can uh, change their position regarding a verdict, the form of the verdict confirms the hypothesis that a language needs to be invented in order to interpret the concept of nature in law. And so in this respect, it becomes useful to summon non-legal expertise from the humanities, activism, and, and art. And this is where council was coming. 
So based on this precedent, Council has developed the Against Nature Journal, and we are talking about it today, uh, and so the Against Nature Journal. We did the first colloquium in 2015 in the organization Ashkelal One, and so over the course of three days, a dozen of guests from different backgrounds shared legal cases referring to nature with the public, with different formats. And after this event, we started thinking about new opportunities for the project, and so we decided to develop the actual structure of the format. So very briefly, the structure of the, of the journal is like this. So it's a three-year, it's supposed to be a three-year pluridisciplinary program of publication, exhibition, event, on the interpretation of the against nature concept in law. Each issue is produced in relation to a focused region, so for now it's India, Lebanon, Kenya, Senegal, Indonesia, Morocco, and Caribbean. Maybe it will change, but it's, the structure is more or less there. And it is in collaboration with local organizations working around topics related to social justice, sexual and identity rights, and international organizations working in the field of art or science. In terms of editorial format, the journal consists of seven essays, <clears throat> gathering the diversity of interpretation of the concept of nature, and we are using legal, but also theoretical, speculative, or fictional approach. The primary audience of the journal is made up of judges, religious leaders, politicians, and researchers. And so the partner organization print the journal in-house and distribute it hand-to-hand. -hand. So therefore, the journal becomes an occasion to engage conversation. Then, in, um, in addition to being distributed to a particular list of recipients in the corresponding local context, the the journal is, uh, is also produced and presented to a broader audience as a program of exhibition, events hosted by artistic and act activist or scientist institution. And during these events, in the frame of this um, yeah, invitation, we also commission and show work of art. So for our collaboration with the Cosmopolis, our presentation, we are showing the work of Jocelyn Gardner, but we, it's, you, you will see it just behind the wall. And it was already presented in Ashkel Adwan, and it will be maybe one of the main work for the Caribbean issue. And um, the image here is a work of Carlos Mota. It was a, a work commission for Ashkel Adwan uh, in Beirut, and it was work rela related to this very context of um, Lebanon in collaboration with an anthropologist, Maya Migdashi. And so this uh, program of event and exhibition is slowly building a network of organization and people who are sharing the same concern. And many of them are not located in countries where these laws are applied. And this is maybe the question you are asking our, yourself. Why are we doing something like this in France and not in the concerned country? But nevertheless, we believe it is necessary to build a network where international justice can be discussed from the perspective of the people who are directly affected by the issues at stake. Also, even if the against nature law has been abolished on July 27, July 27, 1982 in France, the against nature concept is still used against LGBTQI people in France. For example, it was recently used as an argument by La Manif pour tous during the debate about the same sex marriage and it was also previously used in the 80s against people affected by AIDS. Also, as you might know, many extreme right-wing movements, and like Front National in France, try to attract people from LGBT community using stereotype of homophobia in Islam. So, looking carefully at the circulation and use of the concept of against nature and proposing new interpretation, the Against Nature Journal try also to prove that these laws are not only a problem of the so-called South, they belong to an history that we are all responsible of. So that's for my presentation, and I leave Emma to continue. Thank you. Does it work? Yeah. So um, thank you, uh, Gregory. Thank you, of course, our three guest speakers today, Nikita, Arvin, and and Grant, and thank you everyone for uh, being here. I am, as we already mentioned, uh, Aymar Arriola. I'm an editor at the Against Nature Journal. 
and uh, I'll be moderating the uh, time of the, the, the session uh, today. Before introducing our uh, speakers and proceeding with the presentations, I just want to do a couple of opening remarks on the uh, purpose, the tone, and also the structure, the running of the, of the event. As Gregory has mentioned, uh, the Against Nature Journal is produced, not only presented, but produced and presented through a, pro a program of events and exhibitions, such as this one. Um, our guest speakers today have been invited to present pre-reflections, research notes, visual material related to their respective work uh, on aspects of Indian culture and the concept of, of uh, nature against uh, nature, which will provide the basis of full essays to come, full essays to be included in the, in the first issue of the journal. So, and I refer to this to invite everyone here today to consider today's event as an open editorial meeting. Uh, this is for us also, apart from a public presentation, a working, a working session, and um, a working session in which, again, the first three contributors to the journal um, will have the occasion to share with the public the research, the pre preliminary research, and hopefully, perhaps, uh, inform their, their work by, by doing that, both in content and, and form. So, um, why India? Maybe we should refer to um, uh, the, our choice of, of India as uh, the first uh, focus country, the first um, context in which we want to uh, have a look uh, as part of the, of, of the project. The choice of India as our first focus country is not a trivial um, choice, and it responds at least to three considerations. So this year in 2017, um, this year so, the 50th anniversary of the decriminalization of homosexuality in, in the UK, in England, which has been uh, a, a, an event much celebrated across Europe. However, this uh, anniversary has perhaps shadowed the fact that uh, against nature laws uh, remain intact in the penal code of a number of European uh, uh, former colonies, including India and that it continues to oppress, uh, as Greg was mentioning, tens of millions of people. India exemplifies graphically, perhaps better than any other context, that laws are not static, that the context in which we are hoping to make an intervention is not a fixed context, but a, but a context in, in flux. Um, for instance, section 377 of the Indian Penal Code, <clears throat> which is the Indian law that uh, prohibits and, and um, prohibits same-sex uh, activity was drafted by colonialists in the early uh, 1800s to mirror British um, anti-sodomy laws, was repealed in 2009 by a high court in, in India, and again reinstituted re in, in 2013 by the Indian Supreme uh, Court, proving again, and this is uh, our point, that the overall framework of the project uh, is a dynamic and ever-changing uh, framework. And lastly, India was already a prominent case study in Council's event in Beirut in, in 2015, which is, as Gregory has mentioned, the background of the, of the journal. There, it became clear to us that addressing the contemporary status of the, nature, of the notion of nature in law in the laws, the regular gender and, um, and, and sexual expressions require an intersectional and, and transnational perspective. In the case of India, this includes addressing questions of, uh, of class, of, of uh, caste, of ethnicity, of religion throughout history, and again, from an interdisciplinary uh, uh, perspective. And our panel today responds to that plurality of, of, of perspective. I will briefly introduce uh, our three speakers today, who again are the three first contributors to the Against Nature uh, Journal. I will introduce them in, in a row. They will proceed to uh, deliver 20 minutes presentation, presentations of uh, the research, uh, advancing their uh, contributions to the project. After that, we'll have 
again, uh, we realize it's a very kind of tidy schedule. Uh, we're going to try to have a couple of questions um, in the table, trying to bring together the individual perspective of our speakers. But then, of course, we will also have the chance to open the table to the to the floor and, and have a couple of questions from uh, from the public. And I think that will wrap up the, the event. So. Um, I will present the speakers as they will they will present. So Arvin will be the first, uh, Nikita second, and, and Graham uh, third and, and final. So our first guest, uh, Arvin Arain, is um, an, a lawyer and a legal researcher coming from India, who already participated in the Beirut event and who is in fact our main advisor for uh, issue one of the of the journal. Arvin has been working extensively on the 2014 Indian Supreme Court ruling that recognized transgender persons as full citizens of India. Arvin is co-founder of Alternative Law Forum, a plurilegal organization based in Bangalore, uh, concerned with cultural understanding of uh, sexual and gender diversities in, in India, and currently he is Geneva director uh, director at the organization ARC, uh, which is uh, ARC International, which is committed to transnational advocacy on um, LGTB uh, uh, plus rights. And in his presentation today, Arvin, uh, Arvin will offer, I think, a quite a broad overview, uh, a generous overview on of the uh, historical origins of the very term uh, against or the expression the against the order of nature uh, in India and, and in the context of its colonial uh, origins. And I think as well as um, uh, he will point out to the evolution of, of, of the concept of, of the law, applying that this concept through a number of legal interpretations of the same in colonial and post-colonial uh, times in India to finish with a few remarks about the, the contemporary urgency. Uh, Nikita, our second uh, presenter today, um, is professor of political theory and gender studies and director of the research platform Gender Studies, Identities, Discourses and Transformations and at the University of uh, Innsbruck in Austria. Her publications include, uh, just to name a few, um, Impossible Speech on the Politics of Silence and Violence, uh, 2007. Um, Decolonizing Enlightenment, Transnational Justice, Human Rights, and Democracy in Postcolonial World, which was edited, uh, she edited in 2014. Um, or more recently, Difference That Makes No Difference, the Non-Performativity of Interse Intersectionality and Diversity, also edited this year. We first came across uh, Nikita's work through her edited volume, Global Justice and Desire, from uh, 2015, and most recently, both Arvin and I had a chance to uh, uh, hear uh, uh, Nikita's uh, intervention at the most recent Queer Asia Symposium at SOAS in, in London, and we were uh, quite, uh, quite fascinated by, uh, by the presentation. And um, today, Nikita will be sharing her research, uh, ongoing research uh, on tantric approaches, on tantric approach to non-normative, non-normative as sexual um, behaviors and practices in pre-colonial India, and how these were challenged or stigmatized better as unnatural by the, by the British. And um, finally, uh, Grant uh, Watson is a, a curator and a researcher based in, in London. Um, his curatorial projects, uh, including Santal Family, uh, positions around an Indian sculpture from 2007, and projects with individual artists such as Sheila Gouda are based on the um, question, sorry, explore questions of, of life and, and, and life practice and politics through film interviews in a number of contexts to which he will uh, refer. And as I said again uh, today, sorry, a grant will be presented from this project, part of which the most recent leg of which uh, included a series of interviews, a dozen of interviews uh, uh, made in India to a number of LGTV uh, uh, activists and people from the LGTV community, and he will be both speaking and presenting clips from, from this material. So, without further ado, I will uh, yeah, pass the mic to Arvin. 
one. Uh, thanks, Amar, for that very uh, kind introduction. And uh, thanks to Council also for doing work on the idea of what is the order of nature. I believe this is a very compelling and very important issue from, from the point of view of a lot of the ex-British colonies where this law still exists and it has an impact on literally the lives of millions of people. For this presentation, I will take you a little bit through the legal history of this term, where it came from. I will look a little bit into the impact it has at the ground level, and then look at the challenges which are emerging in the Indian context to the idea of against the order of nature. And to begin, the origin of the law might lie in biblical verses, but the legal origin of the law, as far as the, the, uh, the England is concerned, is in something called the Statute of Henry VIII, of 1532, where the language used is criminalizing the detestable and abominable vice of buggery committed with mankind or beast. So it's the vice of buggery committed with mankind or beast. Then a later legal writer, Edward Koch, says buggery is a detestable and abominable, abominable sin among Christians not to be named, committed by carnal knowledge against the ordinance of the creator and order of nature, order of nature, by mankind with mankind or with brute beast. That those are the 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 the, the constituents of the law. A later Brit British writer called Blackstone, who who popularized uh, a lot of the legal work, and his work in fact moved the issue to the to the U to the U.S. and the other uh, and the other former British colonies. He he describes it thus. He compares it to rape, and he says it's an offence of a still deeper malignity the infamous crime against nature committed with either man or beast. And then he says, I will not act so disagreeable a part to my reader as well as to myself as to dwell any longer upon a subject, the very mention of which is a disgrace to human nature. It will be more eligible to imitate in this respect the delicacy of English law and not talk about it. He says it's a crime, that horrible crime, not to be named among Christians. So this is the way the British really thought about it at that moment in time. And when the, the British were drafting the law with respect to India in terms of the penal code, they asked someone called Lord Macaulay to the drafting. And Lord Macaulay is very well known in India for his minute in education, where he makes a very famous statement. I just want to read it out to you. He says, I've never found one among them who could deny that a single shelf of a good European library was worth the whole native literature of India and Arabia. The intrinsic superiority of the Western literature is indeed fully admitted by those members of the committee support the Oriental plan of education. So this is the man who ends up drafting the Indian Penal Code. And as a result of the superior British uh, education, he imports into the law this particular offense called the offense of gratifying unnatural lust. That's the language he uses. And this is in 1837. By 1860, through various processes of discussion, which I can take you through later, but we won't have the time for this now, he finally results in what is referred to as the Indian Penal Code of, of, uh, of 1860. And the language of the Indian Penal Code is, whoever voluntarily has carnal intercourse against the order of nature with any man, woman, or animal shall be punishable with imprisonment for life or imprisonment with either description for term which may extend 10 years and shall also be liable to fine. Again, you might think there's a law which is about India because it's the Indian Penal Code. But strangely enough, this is a law which travels on the backs of empire through all the ex-British colonies. So if you look at Trinidad, look at Jamaica, look at Ghana, you look at Tanzania, look at Uganda, look at Singapore, look at Malaysia, all these countries have versions of this particular law. So the law we're talking about really has a certain kind of global impact. In fact, in a time before globalization, you can refer to globalization of this particular law in all the ex-British colonies. Again, it's a law which was then which was drafted then. What happened as far as the the context in India was concerned, in particular the Indian context was concerned. I won't take you through the judicial interpretation, but uh, judicial interpretation centered around the question of what is carnal intercourse against the order of nature, that is include the acts of oral sex, include the acts of anal sex, what are the sexual acts which come within the purview of this term against the order of nature. So you can imagine that this law has a very deleterious impact. I want to talk about the impact by referring to basically one case from the judicial archive in effect because of a 1932 case called Narsharon was the state of sin. And to pick up on this case, I, I found a really fascinating essay by Foucault called The Lives of Infamous Men, where he's, he's talking about 
picking up these figures from the archive and he says these personages must be obscure that nothing would have prepared them for any notoriety that they would not have endowed with any of the established and recognized nobilities those of birth, fortune, saintliness, heroism or genius nonetheless they be propelled by violence and energy and excess expressed in the malice wildness, baseness, obstinacy or ill fortune that gave them in the eyes of their fellows and in proportion to its very mediocrity, a sort of appalling or pitiful grandeur. So in a sense, what, is the, what, is the, what did Naushirwan do which gave him in the eyes of his fellow people a certain kind of an appalling or pitiful grandeur? The story is really this. In 1932, Naushirwan owned a restaurant in Sindh and he met this boy called Ratan C, who was 18 years of age. Uh, who was 18 years of age. Uh, they met they exchanged glances, something happened between them, either some pre-arranged pre signal or what we really don't know, the, the judicial record doesn't mention that. But whatever happened, they go up to Naushirwan's room, which is one floor above the, above the shop as it were. What happened inside that room, normally is not a matter of concern for you or for me, and I shouldn't really be talking about what happened, what, what Naushirwan did to Ratan say in that room. The only reason we know about it is what happened is a policeman with a grudge was peeping through the keyhole. And what he saw is this, this is what the judges say. What he saw is Narshirwan removed his trousers, loosened the trousers of Ratansi, and made that lad to sit on top of his organ. Ratansi caught up from his lap, but in the meantime, Narshirwan had spent himself, wiped his organ, and put on his pants. This is, this is what the judges say, this is what the, the judgment says. So they're arrested, they marched off to the police station, and they're finally acquitted because they couldn't find proof that the particular act had happened but not before the judge made these particular comments. The judge said, on referring to what, what happened between them, he said that Ratansi appears to be a despicable specimen of humanity. On his own admission, he's addicted to the vice of a catamite. The doctor who examined him is of the opinion that the lad must have been frequently used for unnatural carnal intercourse. The judge notes, however, there's not the slightest symptom of violence on the hind part of the lad. So I want you to take you to a slightly more imaginative realm and imagine what might have gone on between Ratansi and Naushirwan at that moment in that room above that particular hotel. Would they have imagined a world not yet, to, not yet born when the desire would be accepted without a murmur? Were they thinking of an imaginative realm of impossible desires which was really interrupted by the policeman coming in at that particular inopportune moment? So it's really what I would say is a fragile experiment of really creating a little community of love outside the bounded of laws, strictures, and society's norms, which is set upon by society in the form of Solomon and given judicial imprimatur of a failed sexual connection. I think the story of Narshirman and Ratansi speaks to the absence of a certain vocabulary, the language of love and intimacy, longing and desire, and the expression of spontaneous bodily affection find no, so, find no safe habitation within the terms of the law. The law degrades this act of experimental creation of new forms of intimacy. The language of law has an impoverishing effect as it strips the physical act of its possible rich emotional connotations and reduces the act of human connection to perverse, failed sexual connection. The only reason I mention Nao Shirwan's story is because it's emblematic of the ethical and moral poverty of the judiciary, even as it grappled with homosexual expression over 158 years. It's important to note that even after 58 years of coming into language, of the, uh, coming into the, into the coming of the Indian Constitution coming into force, the judges never saw fit to apply any other language other than the language of unnatural, perversity of mind, and immoral to what goes on between these two people in the privacy of their home. The first time this changes is really 158 years after, co after the coming into force, after this particular judgment, after the coming into force of the Indian Penal Code, and 59 years after coming into force of the Indian Constitution when in the judgment of the Delhi High Court called Nas Foundation was the NCR Delhi. And Jawaharlal uh, Nehru, when speaking about the framework of the Indian Constitution, he referred to it as the magic of words, and the judges quote this language. And I want to refer to that as something which is very important here, because what we have in this particular judgment is really the magic of words. Because what the judges say is they take us outside this frame of perversity and refer to what happens between two individuals as an act of intimacy. What they say is, end of the day, individuals have the right to privacy, they have the right to dignity, the right to expression. So when you talk about two individuals, you don't refer to them in terms of perverse, failed, 
sexual connection. We refer to it more in terms of the fact that everybody has a right to intimate expression with the person they may or may not love. And so that's the line, line down which the judges go. So Nurse Foundation was really the first time in 2009 when the Indian judiciary read down this particular, this particular law and held that everybody has the right to privacy, the right to dignity, and the right to expression of their sexuality, as long as, of course, it's in, 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 the, in the sphere of consent. Again, this was a moment of great celebration in 2009, when everyone was very excited that we got this really marvelous judgment from the Delhi High Court. But then, as we all know, it's all love stories come to an end. And so 2009, this happened. In 2013, the Supreme Court, in Suresh Kumar Kaushal's case, basically struck down this particular judgment. Then restored 377 through its full, moral, uh, through its full legal force. What the Supreme Court said, the Supreme Court judgment was best described by uh, uh, Vikram Seth, who's a well-known Indian novelist, as a bad day for law and love. I just want to take you through two points about why is it a bad day for law and why is it a bad day for love. It's a bad day for law because at the end of the day, judgment was not, was not well-reasoned. It was a bad day for law because the judgment failed to respond in any sense of empathy to the voices of suffering before the court. If you have stories of suffering before you, the intrinsic role of a judge is to take the suffering seriously and respond to it with a judgment, which in a sense restores a sense of humanity to people who deny humanity. The judges ignored the suffering before them. It's a bad day for love because, again, we're getting back to the, to the judicial discourse of Nasir One. There's again an uh, impoverishment of language where the judges see human beings in nothing more than the sexual act which they perform. So again, you have a way in which you think of, you think of people as nothing more than orifices. And the judges' discourse during the hearings, they kept going back to the question of what is carnal intercourse against the order of nature? If a, we actually said this, if a father sticks his tongue into the mouth of a son, is that carnal intercourse against the order of nature? If, if a mother does this to a, if somebody sucks on a breast, is that carnal intercourse against the order of nature? So they, they fail to see the point that it's about the lives of people, that it's a question of dignity, and that you can't reduce everything to only the question of sexual act alone, and you have to see things in a slightly broader framework or perspective. I, I think I'll, I'll, I have two more, two more points. Okay, wonderful. Okay. So that is the, what we call the bad day for law and love. But again, that's not the end of the story. Because what we have now is another judgment of the Supreme Court which has declared that the right to privacy is a part of the fundamental right of all, of all Indians. And in that particular judgment, the judges are pointed out to the fact that among the judgments which were, which were a disgrace to the Indian judiciary, one was a judgment to upheld the imposition of the emergency, a second was this judgment which upheld the criminalization of same-sex uh, sexuality. So there is hope at the end of the tunnel, and we think that this judgment will finally be overturned. But I want to make one last related point, which is when we talk about the order of nature, how do we really think about the order of nature outside the judicial discourse as well? And the idea which came to us when you think about, thinking about it in the Indian context is that in India, the order of nature is not just about the same-sex acts or relationships between people of the same sex. It also includes the idea of, for example, when a, when, a, when a Muslim boy falls in love with a Hindu girl or runs away with a Hindu girl, or when a Dalit boy falls in love with a upper caste girl. When people disrupt these boundaries of caste and religion, that also disrupts the order of nature. So in a sense, what we're looking at, what we're very, very interested in, is how do we broaden this idea of the struggle against the order of nature to take on board the range of hierarchies which are there in Indian society and think of a struggle with a sense of eroticism of love, how it is to phrase it at its heart. How can you think of love as a way of disrupting this way of thinking about society? Can we think of love as a revolutionary force which can begin to change or transform these relationships? Again, I mention this because uh, Often people, maybe not in a necessarily very political frame, but very often it's young people in the Indian context who are running away against the, the imprimatur of the family, against, the, against what the society says,
to be with the one they love, be it across lines of religion or lines of caste or in terms of the same sex context. And in a sense, what I see, the way I see it, the future, as far as this idea of against the order of nature, is to try and get on board a range of these struggles which are happening in the, uh, the local context and take it forward in some fashion. And I've referred in some sense to the context in India, and maybe I'll just one last point I'll make about the fact that I think there are remarkable, important stories to be told in all parts of the world as far as the struggle against the order of nature goes. I just want to refer to two contexts. One, I think, is the context of Egypt, where they have a law which, which criminalizes what they call debauchery. And recently, we saw the most extreme form of criminalization, where there's a, there was a, a concert in which a gay, uh, a gay singer from the Lebanese band was performing. And there were Egyptians who waved the rainbow flag in that particular concert. Post that, they were all arrested. There's mass arrest in terms of the LGBT community within, within Egypt itself. And there's a kind of a crackdown which is happening on the community. The reason I mention this again is because I think it's very, very important to take on board the kind of authoritarianism which is happening as far as both CC in Egypt is concerned, which is having this negative impact on people. We look at, need to look at the context of Nigeria where similar kind of problems are there. And the context of Indonesia, where again, the, what is on the agenda is recriminalization. So in a sense, the point to make is not that this is a top-down perspective, but the fact that there are these lives, remarkable lives in each of these countries, where people are taking up these struggles. And I think the idea of the, order of, the struggle against the order of nature, the idea of this journal, is how do we support these struggles in each of these contexts and take it to a different plane and ensure that people are free of the impact or people are free of this uh, burden of the order of nature. That was preferably time. Thank you. And um, Nikita will be next. Um, I'd like to start by thanking uh, the council and Pompidou. It's a great, great pleasure to be here. Um, I'm going to somehow follow up on what Arvind just presented, and so, of course, a great pleasure to also be on the panel with Arvind and Grant. Um, now, as Arvind pointed out, that in post-colonial India, the legacies of British penal code are currently being upheld by the courts to criminalize that which is deemed against the order of nature. So even after seven decades of independence, um, what we are seeing is still the hegemony, still the dominance of, a Victorian, uh, of the Victorian mot uh, morality, whereby the post-colonial narrative views sexuality as a corrupting force to be contained within family and marriage. Yeah? So it's a very normative framing of how sexuality has to be approached. Now, what I hope to show in my talk is, um, um, I, I, what, I tried, what I'm gonna try and do in my talk is trace the continuities and discontinuities between pre-colonial, colonial, and post-colonial narratives on the normal and the natural, um, and how these are constituted as heterosexual, marital, monogamous, reproductive, non-commercial sexual uh, practices. Uh, my, uh, my intervention or my belief is that historicizing sexuality, so when you think about sexuality, it's important to have a certain historical perspective because this helps trace the shifting frames of normativity and non-normativity. And here, of course, like I've already mentioned Michel Foucault, I'm also drawing on Michel Foucault and um, one of the most important insights that Foucault offers us is that if we understand how truths about sex and desire are constructed, then it's also, I mean, if we understand how things are made, it's also possible to unmake them. Yeah, to, so if we understand how they're constructed, we can also deconstruct them. Foucault doesn't use the notion of deconstruction. I'm putting words in his mouth, so to speak. So my effort is going to be, uh, in my, um, my little presentation, short presentation, is to offer a counter-narrative, a counter-discourse on body, pleasure, sex, and desire. Now, it's a bit dangerous to, as an Indian, to be talking about Tantra to a Western audience, because there's always the dangers of Orientalism. Uh, some of you all might know that Tantra is one of the biggest exports pro export products of India, besides Bollywood and yoga. Yeah, Tantra sex is extremely popular. 
I um, actually stumbled upon uh, the uh, Tantra philosophy. I'm, I'm trained as a philosopher. Uh, when I was kind of engaging with uh, philosophical positions and political discourses which argued both homosexuality as well as homophobia to be colonial legacies. So the former position that homosexuality was imported into India um, was basically propagated by the nationalists who argued that homosexuality was a colonial import and this erased any indigenous forms of non-normative sexual practices and subjectivities. The latter point that homophobia was imported into India, yeah, that India was always sexually enlightened. If you engage with Indian history, there's you know Tantra and Kama Sutra, if you look at temple ar architecture, art, that India was always sexually enlightened, that actually homophobia was imported into India through colonialism by the Britishers, somehow erases pre-colonial forms of heteronormative violence. So I found both these positions problematic and somehow uh, um, the, my engagement with Tantra discourses was very useful in problematizing both these positions. So um, it helped cl clarify, so my engagement with Tantra helped clarify how normative sexual practices were promoted by the orthodox Brahmanical tradition. Yes, yeah, so it was not just the colonizers who brought it in, but the already pre-colonial um, discourses, there was the idea of the order of nature, which was somehow consolidated by the British uh, and reinforced and also transformed to a certain extent by the British colonizers. And um, also uh, the subversions to this idea of order of nature. Yeah? So what was uh, uh, read by the tantrics uh, or tantra practitioners as against the grain. So it's interesting how the notion of nature as well as against nature was mobilized by both sides to somehow, uh, to, to somehow legitimize their respective ideologies. Now the British colonizers intervened in these debates and reinforced the idea of natural sex and sexuality, marginalizing stigmatizing practices that did not conform to the colonial normative order so that sexual practices that were coded as against the north order of nature were deemed sinful, indecent, and illegal, and were pathologized and medicalized. And like I said, there are certain continuities between hegemonic indigenous discourses already. So I'm not saying that, you know, um, um, somehow the, the stigmatization of, of non-normative practices started with the colonizers. There were already pre-colonial forms of marginalizations that were somehow built upon and taken up by the colonizers, by the British colonizers. Now the concept and practice of philosophy itself in ancient India is inextricably linked to the notion of liberation, whereby philosophy is seen to be a quest for knowledge, so the Sanskrit term is vidya, which eliminates ignorance and in turn brings liberation. So there are different terms to signify liberation, like moksha, nirvana, or mukti. Now different paths, uh, different schools um, preach different paths to liberation. Now interestingly, Tantra, I mean usually when one uh, thinks of, how many of you all have heard the term Tantra before in the audience? Okay, a few of you all. So one usually associates Tantra with sensual gratification. Yeah, it's, it, one usually thinks it's all about anything goes. But actually the term is, uh, um, is very closely linked to the idea of self-discipline, self-cultivation and ritual conduct and is indispensable for the correct practice of freedom. Yeah? So Tantra, and it's important to note here that it's not a timeless, consistent set of practices, rather it's a very complex array of rituals, theoretical and narrative strategies that are specific to various religions, cultural, social, political, geographical and historical contexts. So there is you know, Buddhist tantra, uh, tantric practices, there is Hindu tantric practices, there is tantric practices in Tibetan Buddhism, which are very different to tantric practices that happen in, for example, um, um, uh, in the south of India. Yeah? So there are, uh, there are different, different versions of it, although one uses this label of tantra. Now, it is claimed that it originated around 500 BC and uh, increasingly extended over the Vedic tradition as well as the heterodox traditions of Jainism and Buddhism. Now, during the Victorian colonization of India, the tantric practitioners were driven underground. The earliest accounts of Tantra to reach the West were penned by missionaries and administrators who presented them as evidence of Eastern depravity. They were quite shocked, yeah, what they saw in India. And they, you know, talked about these 
wholesale orgies that were happening in which every taboo was broken and all propriety perverted. Thus, most interpretations of the original, I mean, what we hear uh, in these narratives, in these archives, are actually very tame, domesticated versions, uh, some by already orthodox Brahmins and others by the civilizing uh, missionaries and Britishers. Today, and I've already pointed this out, tantric sex has become one of the biggest export products of India besides yoga and bhakti. <laughs> now, in the post-colonial context, tantra is associated with secrets, cults, and mysterious powers of banalized as arbitrary gratification of pleasure, namely, basically, the more sex you have, the better. So people just think that tantric sex is just, you know, an older version of Tinder or Grindr. But I hope that in the next 10 minutes that I have, 12 minutes that I have, I'll be able to show that it's, it's much more than an early form of Tinder or Grindr. Um, the term itself, Tantra, comes from the root word Tan, which means, um, which is kind of uh, uh, is associated with uh, the idea of expansion. Yeah. Yeah? And it also means thread or cord and, donate, uh, and denotes a web. So it's, a, it's something that expands and encompasses um, more and more. It, 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 it's an ongoing process. And it also stands for system or ritual. And according to the traditional experience, Tantra is something that expands knowledge. And it is interesting that in contrast to the ascetic tradition, yeah, so where knowledge is not just about gathering information or wisdom, here, karma, which is desire, is the path to liberation. It's quite interesting because in the ascetic tradition, uh, it's all about um, giving up things. You know, you give up all your worldly possessions, uh, you become a yogi, you, you know, uh, discard your clothes, you discard your fami uh, family um, ties, uh, familial ties, you give up all your wealth. Here it's interesting that the tantrics argue that you use desire as a means not to transcend the world, but to gain worldly and spiritual pleasures. Yeah, so that's a, a, the term that's used for pleasure is bhukti. For, furthermore, the practice of tantra is linked to disciplining, which I already pointed out. But this is different. So discipline is not about control. This is not about, you know, uh, saying I'll only have sex on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, on Fridays. And it's also not the Fifty Shades of Grey kind of sex where, you know, you have a contract and you have, um, I don't know, hard limits and, hard, you know, safe words. But rather, um, this, is, this is a kind of self-regulation which kind of mobilizes desire to emancipate yourself. So let me just um, read out a fascinating quote that I found in the Vamaka Ishwara Tandra. And uh, they say, one should cultivate desire by means of desire. One should cast desire into desiring, uh, into desire. Desiring by means of desire, abiding in desire, one should stir the world. End of quote. Now the canonical traditions denounced tantric practices and, as antinomian. Yeah. Uh, which could be kind of read as against the order of nature, as unnatural, um, against the accepted norm, against that which was considered as normal. The tantric texts interestingly use terms like pratiloman and paravriti to describe themselves. And pratiloman means against the grain. And pra pra paravriti means inversion um, of the existing order. So some tantric practitioners made a way of life out of this principle of reversal. And uh, they had quite extreme lifestyles. So they would walk up, up, uh, around naked, live amongst heaps of garbage, or in graveyards. Yeah? The last sex, I mean, the last place you would associate with erotics. Or, you know, uh, the last place where you would, unless you're a necro, uh, uh, ne necrophilia, but mostly you would not associate graveyards as something uh, that would arouse desire. But um, interestingly, what was considered polluting or unclean or unnatural by the hegemonic tradition was turned around by the tantrics and was uh, everything that was seen as unnatural, unnormal was turned around by the tantrics and mobilized um, in order to somehow pursue what they thought was the path to desire, uh, pleasure, and ultimately to salvation. So. Um, 
in contrast to the ascetic traditions in India, which thought which thought of the body as an inconvenience. Yeah, I mean we bleed, we have all these liquids in our body. So transcendence was always the overcoming of the body. In contrast to this tradition, the tantrics thought of the body as the means to salvation. Yeah, the pleasure, the uh, desires, the erotics that the body experiences is a path to pleasure. So let me, I just previously quoted a tantric text, now let me quote uh, um, a, 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 a citation, now let me um, share with you all a quote from a very hegemonic tradition and I quote, they say, I have ab abandoned the desire, that desire that makes one ill, kill one, kills one, it makes one take the crooked path destroys the power of the mind, destroys virtue, burns one out, spoils the soul and makes the body impure. I throw away the desire. I wash myself clean. Yeah, so these are two very oppositional discourses. One which sees desire as corrupting, as something that needs to be uh, purged, something we need to get rid of. And another which sees desire as something that will lead us to salvation. As embodiment, affirmation of embodiment as a path to liberation. Um, so one sees a certain affinity between the dualisms that one encounters in hegemonic western discourses and the tantric discourses. So for example, uh, one knows the, one of the most important uh, uh, dualisms in western uh, epistemology is between nature and spirit. And this is also present in Indian orthodox epistemology. Nature is prakriti and uh, spirit is purusha. And interestingly, Prakriti is the feminine principle and Purusha is the male, masculine principle. Uh, so Prakriti, the feminine principle, is equated with suffering. Embodiment is separated, uh, is equated with Dukkha, which is suffering, is suffering. And the male, the masculine principle, is uh, equated with um, uh, bliss. Yeah? So to overcome your body uh, is the path to bliss. And uh, suffering, of course, dukkha is not desirable, and bliss is something that is desirable. So there's a very interesting equation between the feminine embodiment and suffering, and that which is undesirable, and the masculine overcoming of the body, and that which is desirable. Um, so the woman, the feminine principle is seen in the, in the hegemonic orthodox uh, discourse is seen as an obstruction to the path of liberation for the ascetic tradition. Tantra subverts this equation by transforming the feminine into the manifestation of power, into Shakti. So another very interesting quote from the Kula Arnava Tantra, it says, the yogin cannot be the bhogin and the bhogin cannot be a knower of yoga. However, O beloved Kula, which is superior to every uh, koala, uh, which is uh, uh, superior to everything, is the essence of bhoga and yoga. O mistress of the koala, in the kula thinking, bhoga is directly conducive to yoga, sin is conducive to good karma, and the world is conducive to liberation. So bhoga, which stands for pleasure, and bhogin, which is the feminine form, is the one who is a pleasure seeker. Um, and this was denounced in the orthodox tradition, but is celebrated in the tantric tradition. So here, um, there is a compatibility between the feminine, the feminine embodiment and the pursuit of desires and freedom. And here the relationship between the teacher and the student is also very interesting because this, this, the teacher is feminized, which is very, very different from the orthodox tradition where the teacher is always the masculine. Yeah? And here, um, the, the, the feminine principle is seen to be the authoritarian principle from which we can learn. Now, uh, there are two main, and I'll move to my conclusion, I have four more minutes. Um, uh, there are two main schools of Tantra. One is the, which is the more, one is the Vamachara, which is the more radical, subversive one, and the other is the Dakshinachara, uh, which is more conventional. Now, Vama, interestingly, stands for both woman and left hand. Yeah, and these schools, um, somehow lay great emphasis on personal experience and um, um, are quite, uh, quite subversive, as I've, I've said repeatedly, of the more orthodox appro approach to questions of uh, liberation. Now, um, one last point and then I'll move to my concluding statement. Um, 
There is one particularly very, very interesting school within tantric philosophy called the uh, Kaula branch of Tantra, which originated around the 5th AD, and it re revolves around the worship of the goddess of Kupchika. Uh, and Kupcha actually means the crooked one. And here, uh, there's a very, very strong presence of the feminine principle, the Shakti principle, and here women played a very, very important role. Uh, because this, and there are a lot of homosexual, lesbian elements in this part, because uh, in, in this school, because the female devotees worship the goddess in a very, very erotic way, uh, erotic form. And uh, here, um, all men, the imperative is that all men, if they want to gain salvation, they have to become women. That's the only, you, can, you can't gain salvation in a male body, you have to become a woman, worship the goddess, so it's a very, very strong homoerotic element, and then gain salvation. So quote, cast off the masculine in yourself, become a woman, then you will be a non-dual self and abode in eternity. Love and sex only after you have become a feminine. Um, oh man, you should become a woman, end of quote. <laughs> so at the core, uh, of this tradition is everything that is considered unnatural. Yeah? Alcohol, meat, drugs, fish, uh, sexual intercourse is considered the path to salvation. Yeah? So they, this is the reading against the grain that they kind of co-opt that is considered to be the order of nature and turn it around and say this is what is going to get us salvation. Um, and one of the most Im important symbolic figures of this tradition is the goddess Kali. And I don't know if you have an image in mind. I, I thought I would bring it, but I was not sure if there would be technical support. So what you see of Kali is she's dancing and she has these um, uh, skulls around her neck. And she's dancing on the body of a blue figure, Shiva. And actually, Shiva is her husband. So she's dancing, she's just killed her husband and she's dancing on the dead body of the husband and she has a tongue out. And in the orthodox tradition, it is said that she has a tongue out because she's ashamed that she's just killed her, uh, her husband. But in the tantric tradition, she's dancing because she is showing her power. Yeah, that she, she, she has overcome the masculine principle and has, uh, in a certain way, it's a celebration of the feminine principle. So I'm gonna end, um, I, uh, with a very interesting, I was, the time when I was engaging with tantric philosophy was also a time when I was reading Foucault's History of Sexuality, one of those coincidences one has in life. And um, it was quite uh, interesting that I found a very nice quote by Foucault where he talks about how the cultivation of desire is a very, very important aspect of um, developing a different economy of bodies and pleasures. And Foucault talks about Ars Erotica. And I had to think about, I, 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 ha, I had the feeling that if I had met Foucault, I would have told him a little bit about Tantric philosophy. And I'm sure he would have enjoyed it. So I'll end with a very nice quote of Foucault's and just bear it in my, bear in mind what I just said about the Tantric re kind of mapping and reconfiguration of what is considered to be natural and the order of nature when you hear this quote by Foucault, so my last 20 seconds. Um, in the erotic art, truth is drawn from pleasure itself, understood as a practice and accumulated as experience. Pleasure is not considered in relation to an absolute law of the permitted and the forbidden, nor by reference to a criteria of utility, but first and foremost in relation to itself. In this way, there is formed a knowledge that must remain secret not because of an element of infamy that might attach to its object, but because of the need to hold in it, in it the greatest reserve, since according to the tradition, it would lose its effectiveness and its virtue by being divulged. Consequently, the relation to the master who holds the secret, only he, and I'll add she, can transmit this art. The effects of this masterful art are said to transfigure the one fortunate enough to receive its privileges, an absolute mastery of the body, a singular bliss, obliviousness of time and limits, the elixir of life, the exile of death and its threats. Thank you very much.
so thank you, Nikita. I'm, I'm sure Foucault will have enjoyed that as well. Um, so now our third and, and final presenter, Grant. So thanks. Thank you. Is this microphone even working? Yes. yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to talk, I'm going to show some material um, from a project that I've been working on since 2012, which is called How We Behave. And um, interestingly, this project also began with a Foucault reference. So I found a um, magazine article, an interview with Foucault with, um, in Vanity Fair from 1983. I don't know if you, either of you know this odd piece of popular culture, but it was an article that he made in Vanity Fair, and it's actually a very interesting synopsis of his work at that time. So he was um, finishing up his History of Sexuality books, and he was shifting his focus quite substantially um, from sort of European histories of sexuality to, um, I mean, sort of modern European histories to um, histories from antiquity. And in particular, he was looking at um, sort of practical philosophy from the first and second century BC, um, from Stoic and Epicurean and Cynic sources. And he was thinking about uh, practices of the self, what he called the care of the self, and the potential for subjects to uh, employ different techniques and, and, and processes of thinking and doing um, in ways through which they could actually um, develop an idea of a life practice. And simultaneously, he was also teaching in, in the United States, in California, and he was becoming sort of um, emerged in a gay subculture. Um, so in relation to your tantric point, he was also famously visiting sadomasochist clubs and experimenting with kind of extreme forms of sexuality. Um, one of the points that Foucault makes in the, in the interview is that um, it's impossible to make a reading between different historical periods. So you can't look at, I mean, all of the work he did in the archive was not by way of comparison. Um, so you can't make a reading from the way that people behaved in antiquity to the present day. But what maybe you can do is think about maybe similar questions and problematics. And the problematic that Foucault addresses in the interview is to do with um, how, what do you do when a kind of moral structure comes apart? Um, and the way that he addresses this is through a consideration of how, in antiquity, the relationship between ethics and religion was very weak. So religion was, in his reading of it, was seen very much as a kind of ritual, a set of rituals, but ethics was something which had to be figured out by the subject. And his argument is that in the sort of post-liberation period of the 1960s, and, in 1970s and 80s, that, you know, gay community, uh, all the people who had started to question and deconstruct moral systems were now left with, in a way, a kind of lacuna and the challenge um, to think about kind of new ways of relating new forms of ethical practice. So my project doesn't have that kind of philosophical question um, in quite the same way. I mean, my, my project really um, emerged through a desire to um, think about contemporary life, contemporary subjects, but bring into that, I think, some of the, the challenges that Foucault um, brought up in his work in the early 80s. And to think in particular how um, different ways of life, different forms of behavior um, are developed largely through um, the ongoing evolution of uh, LGBT community discourses around feminism and so forth. And so what I set out to do was to um, start this interview project. So I started uh, in, uh, initially in the United States and then I did interviews in Brazil and then I did them in Europe and then finally in India and I'll show some of these in a few minutes. Um, and my question was really to do with um, how, how does one formulate a life practice and how does one experience then feed into a political practice? Um, so 
what I'll do is first I'll show a, actually another Sorry, we're a little bit out of So the first interview is an artist called Michelle Dizon from Los Angeles, and she, uh, I think what's maybe uh, interesting in relation to the conversation we're having is the way that she talks about uh, poetics. And when I heard this comment by the judge in Lebanon, Lebanon where he was talking about a kind of, maybe a more a poetic notion of the law, it also made me think of uh, Michelle's interview and the way she, she talks about poetics as a, a sort of a, a tool through which to reflect on our life and think about our life. So I'll start by playing Michelle's interview. My name is Michelle Dizon. I'm an artist, a writer, a filmmaker, a teacher, a scholar. And um, I'm, I'm very moved by the work of Ellen Sissou. Um, I, I remember one passage in her book, Group Prints, where she, she writes about how um, she's so glad that this one um, feminist activist friend of hers exists because that friend does everything that she can to protect the political. And she says that that's what opens up a space for her to protect the poetic. I also think about the work of Lusa Rigure, and um, you know, in, in, in the last chapter, I think of this sex which is not one. She writes about how women have to create a, a space for themselves to learn how to speak because um, language is, is itself patriarchal and there hasn't been that space within, um, within society for women to learn how to speak. So she, she really wants to, um, to assert this, this kind of space for women to be together to learn that, that and, and I think shift the terms of, of the language that they will speak together. And more than anything, I'm, I'm moved by the work of Audre Lorde, who, um, from a black feminist, lesbian position, says that poetry is not a luxury. It's not only for the wealthy. But she, only she, but she describes it as the very quality of light by which we scrutinize our lives. So, you know, uh, in this context, I'm, um, I really think that we need to shift away from an idea of expression that's grounded in a, in a kind of individualist um, notion of what it means for me to tell you about myself, and instead try to understand, uh, you know, poetics as this this work of of the space in between our being together. Fundamental to that might also be an understanding of ourselves as subjects of history. And by that I mean that um, we are subjects constituted within social and political and historical circumstances which have in fact determined um, what we can understand as our desire or what we can understand as what is possible um, for ourselves in the world. And and for me, that's not a, a kind of um, impingement, let's say, on the idea of expression. It's actually a precondition for an idea of expression that exists in the space in between in the relation that we hold to each other. Um, I've also been taught by women of color that it's uh, very necessary to think and work in the gaps in between discourses. And I think that comes out of understanding that as subjects of history, um, we are operating within layered sites of oppression. And so when one works in the gap, 
or when we're one works in the silence is, it actually offers a, a condition of possibility for thinking critically about the ways in which discourse um, is not just language as it exists and can be expressed, but the ways in which discourse actually has very real material effects on our lives. So, so that was uh, part of the first set of interviews I made in the United States. And then um, about a year and a half ago, I made a trip to India and interviewed um, a series of um, mostly queer activists. Um, and one, one of them was uh, a woman called Abina Aha, um, who is transgender and told her story. The, the actual interview is about 30 minutes long. And it's a kind of narrative arc from her early childhood experience of identifying as a woman to a kind of rather triumphant um, becoming um, as one of the uh, most important, working one of the most important HIV NGOs in Delhi and, and one of the first transgender people to occupy such a position. Um, we don't have time to play the whole interview, so I'll just play the beginning and the end. Hi, my name is Abhina Hir, and I'm from India. I was born and brought up in Mumbai. Um, it was unfortunate that when I was three years of age, my father passed away because of brain hemorrhage. I was raised by uh, a single mother, my mother, which is very important for me. Uh, she's not only raised me, but also taught and provided a lot of principles and support in my life. Uh, she, is a, she is a government servant, and she used to work as a clerk in the government hospital. But at the same time, uh, she was also an accomplished dancer. So she kept pursuing her art. Uh, she used to compete and she used to take part in all the government dramatics and acts and plays. And I remember I used to go and attend all of them. Uh, I used to be extremely um, curious about how is she going to look? How is she going to perform? Uh, and I remember that is uh, she used to have a practice where she used to call me backstage before she enters on a stage and she used to introduce me to everybody uh, who was working with her uh, in that drama or in that uh, dance act or something like that. And she used to say that, see, meet my child, see, meet my child with a lot of pride. And I used to say that was the time when I decided that is without her knowledge, I'm going to learn how she, how uh, the, the same way she dances and I'm going to learn uh, dancing behind her back. When I used to home, she, she was a working woman, so she was she used to work all the time. And when I used to be at home, uh, I used to stand in front of a mirror, get dressed up like her, use all her jewelry possible. And I used to, I remember I used to uh, exactly dance like her. Initially, it started with me expressing myself in front of a mirror, but that extended to having a dance performance in front of my neighbors. My neighbors, they used to really love my dancing. You know how when the children are growing up, nobody questions their important sexuality, their genders. I remember quite often, you know, boys are dressed up as a girl, girls are dressed up as a boys, and nobody questions about it. So for my neighbors, there was nothing issue about me getting dressed up as a female and performing in front of them. But it was a big thing for me, because at the age of six, I somewhere had an intuition that I'm not comfortable with the body that I belong, belong to and I want to be somebody different. I knew my heart was of a female. I used to perform in front of my neighbors. One day, my mother um, left the office early and she came back home and what she saw that I was performing in front of my neighbors. She was shocked. She was extremely shocked. And uh, she, she got really angry. She made me sat in front of God and say almost thousand times that I will never do this again. And in my heart I was saying that I really want to do this again, again, and again. That was the... So, 
So in the meantime, Abina goes through this um, process of transitioning um, to, to, to becoming a woman and um, takes on this, this through, through various different kind of stages, takes on this, this role as uh, working for this NGO. And this is her talking about that. Uh, we also um, try to raise money for transgender people or being uh, seven years down the line we we work for also corporate sector um, you know engagement however meanwhile when I was working for Johns Hopkins Institute and when Johns Hopkins Institute was winding up their work after three years I was very uncertain what kind of job I will be doing unfortunately I met uh, the director of program policy of India HIV AIDS Alliance called as Sonal Mehta and I knew that she's very sensitive to the uh, queer people. Uh, when I met her, I remember in Vadala AIDS com complex, she mentioned to me saying that is, there is this opportunity and I want you to work for I want you to apply for it. I said, what is this opportunity? She said, listen, this opportunity is the biggest opportunity for any trans woman or a hijra person because this, this is a 26 million project for five years, going to be working with 400,000 transgenders and men having sex with men on HIV AIDS uh, with 200 community based organizations, six regional partners and it's a global fund program. It's a huge program that no other trans person has managed till that time. You appear for the interview. I appeared for the interview. Fortunately, I got selected. I started working during that on the national level on HIV AIDS program and there were a lot of instances where I wanted to quit. Uh, because I was put, a, put up on a, uh, um, a strong litmus test indicators. Um, and uh, I used to go back and cry. I used to feel that, oh, I must go back. I don't want to work this, work like this. Uh, but, you know, my, my supervisor, Sunal Mehta, she kept saying that is, you know, think big. Don't think small. These things will hurt you, but when you will come to know uh, how to run this game, you will be the game changer. Uh, you will be you will be changing the perspective of how people look at you or how people behave to you and that would be very important things. I kept working stronger uh, with my hard work uh, within the last two decades we have managed to work on trans issues and uh, fortunately in April 2014 highest court of India Supreme Court gave a judgment for accepting transgender as a third gender category. And the last interview is um, someone who's been mentioned already, is Anjali Gopalan from the uh, NAS Foundation, who was the person who brought the case against, uh, tried to, um, who challenged the uh, Section 377 and was successful. Um, and her interview um, actually starts with her experience in the United States dealing with the AIDS crisis in the 1980s and how this galvanized her to work with the LGBT community um, and finally come to the point of becoming involved um, in this legal battle. in total shock and that's when we said okay we need to tackle this law because clearly this law is what you, it's an illegal activity so I said but you're the man must have been more well, one look at him and a point that happened for me was when um, this young man who had come in for counseling and with his parents he went away after we spent about three, four hours with the parents and then I didn't hear from him, which is not uncommon because very often parents would stop their child from coming back to us. But a few months later he came into my office looking absolutely bereft and I, I just took one look at him and I, you, you know how sometimes you look at someone and you just feel, oh my God, what's happening? And he says, I don't know what to do. Um, my parents took me to one of the major hospitals in Delhi and they gave me electric shocks so that I wouldn't, so that I would become straight. And I 
I think there are very few times in my life when I kind of really lose my cool. And that must have been one, one such time. I just, I didn't know what to do. And I said, okay, I think immediately, because that was my first response, let's go to the National Human Rights Commission. So that day itself, we wrote up the complaint next morning, early in the morning, and I'm not a morning person, but I actually got up and charged off to the National Human Rights Commission with my complaint. And they said they wouldn't fight, they, they wouldn't accept it. And I said, why? They said, because it's an illegal activity. So I said, but you're the National Human Rights Commission, right? You guys are the ones who are supposed to. They said, sorry. So I, I came back, I was in total shock. And that's when we said, OK, we need to tackle this law. Because clearly, this law is what is at the basis of all the problems. And so the next year, we filed. Um, uh, to get a reading down of Section 377, because at that time, in 2001 when we filed, um, the same law was used to uh, prosecute child sex abusers. We did not have a law specific against child sexual abuse. Yeah. I think I'll finish there. Thank you. So um, thank you, Grant. It's, uh, it's a pity that there's not an opportunity to show uh, longer sections of the interviews. Hopefully, uh, there will be in a future in, in the same um, uh, context. So thank you to our three um, speakers for the very rich presentations. They were, these were obviously quite uh, different interventions with affinities, uh, clear affinities among um, the, the three of them, at the center of which is the very concept of nature, of the, 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 the concept of the order of nature as a, a moral disruption, as a cultural formation that reflects the uh, values and the dominant uh, morality of, of a time uh, which is uh, culturally constituted through, through language and social uh, practices and is uh, historically um, uh, constituted um, has a, a historical specificity. I know uh, our three speakers today have done an enormous uh, effort to fit within uh, the, the allocated 20 minutes, and I think and we have discussed this before. They would be happy to have some extra minutes to, number one, as a possibility, react to their fellow speakers' uh, presentations, or maybe to go back and just highlight or uh, further elaborate um, specific aspects of the presentation. And my request to you would be to do so, either to react to your fellow speakers uh, or to elaborate some specific, one specific uh, idea in four minutes, uh, no more, by bringing uh, your position closer to the overall uh, overarching framework of the project and the panel, which is the concept of nature, um, the concept of the order of nature. We had a, a, a preliminary preparatory session this afternoon in which our speakers have produced uh, small uh, video capsules that will in the future accompany their text in uh, the project's website, which will be one of the places, one of the uh, means by which the journal will be distributed. And um, I think there were a number of interesting things that were uh, brought uh, earlier this afternoon that we thought would be nice and important to share publicly today. So I'll leave it to you to follow uh, the order that um, <laughs> the order the panel you feel uh, which is best maybe. Uh, yeah, let's do that. Okay, I'll, uh, what I find fascinating about the concept of nature or natural is that one gets the impression that somehow it's a timeless universal category that can stretch in all directions, irrespective of socio-economical, cultural, historical differences. And um, um, what is fascinating is just, uh, or I think political intervention or the possibility of resistance and strategies and tactics of re resistance can emerge when we somehow historicize this category of nature, natural, 
unnatural order of nature because like I said uh, earlier following Foucault, if we know how it's made, one can unmake it. Yeah? If we see how it's constructed in different contexts, whether it's legally, whether it's you know culturally, one can deconstruct it. So uh, I was earlier saying that you know it's quite interesting to notice that actually nothing we do is natural. Or many things that we do are unnatural. Flying, I just flew into Paris. Yeah? Uh, the fact that we eat cooked food, that's not really natural, that's not how we The fact that we wear clothes, the fact that we're sitting under lights at this time of the day. And yet there are only specific, and nobody would say that you know we should punish or sanction people who fly or eat cooked food or you know uh, stay awake at this point in the evening. So it's interesting to, to reflect upon why certain practices and certain subjectivities are targeted as unnatural, whereas other practices and subjectivities are rewarded for being unnatural. So here this would be an intervention, a possible intervention into, um, into historicizing it, uh, what is considered natural or unnatural. The other thing that I find uh, interesting about the concept is how it's mobilized and presented as common sense. Yeah? Here I'm drawing on Antonio Gramsci's idea of how hegemony or hegemonic discourses present their own perspective as self-evident. So, so that one doesn't have to explain it. Only if you deviate from it do you need to justify your position because then it's not self-evident and it's not commonsensical. So uh, it's interesting uh, if one sees it in a larger geopolit as a larger how sexuality was targeted in a larger geopolitical context, and here I'll move slightly away from India to focus on Europe. So during colonialism, uh, European norm and European framing of sexuality was seen as commonsensical. So when they travelled into the colonies, into contexts like India, and saw you know sexual practices which deviated from a very normative framing that you know it only has to be sex for um, procreation, not for recreation. Sex should only be in the missionary position. Yeah, man on top, woman below. And they saw this, um, this, this, this writings like the Kama Sutra, and was so shocked. Yeah? I, how many of you are familiar with Kama Sutra? A few more people. I always say Kama Sutra is one of the most boring texts ever written. It's like a IKEA manual. Yeah, I mean the way you put together a. You know, a shelf, it's like, you know, you touch her here and you stroke her here and you kiss her here and it's like 10 steps to an orgasm. And it's so boring and it still managed to, you know, shock the Britishers. Yeah? They were like, oh my God, look at these wild, promiscuous Indians. We have to civilize them and we have to tell them how to do proper sex and tame them. Now it's the other way around. When they talk about unnatural, it's like, oh my God, look at all these homophobic uh, non-Europeans. And the Europeans stage themselves as sexually enlightened, sexually modern, so that if there is a problem with unnatural sexuality, it's because, you know, there are these um, repressed non-European people who need to be liberated. Yeah? So it's also interesting how at different points in history, the categories of natural and unnatural suit the groups who mobilize it and weaponize it to legitimize civilizational discourses, cultural discourses, and imperialist, racist, uh, homophobic, yeah, keep adding, um, discourses to present themselves as superior to that which deviates from what is constructed as the norm. So here, and I'll end there, um, Judith Butler's idea of normative violence becomes very interesting. So what Butler argues um, uh, is that when we think about violence, we mostly think about violence that one person does to another or a group of people do to another. And um, what we somehow disregard or overlook is that norms themselves have the power to exert violence on those bodies, on those practices that divert from the norm. And here the category of natural and order of nature becomes very powerful because those who cannot fulfill or do not want to fulfill or conform to the category of natural or unnatural, so to speak, in white violence, make themselves vulnerable to the violence which they supposedly deserve for deviating from the law. So I think these kinds of um, reflections become very interesting when we 
analyze it from a legal discourse, but also from a uh, from from a from a perspective of power and um, uh, resistance. And one last point I cannot not uh, mention. I forgot to mention it earlier, and I thought I should uh, take this opportunity. That Foucault once said that uh, uh, he was asked how he would like to die. He wrote in his later works a lot about when he was engaging with very transgressive sexual practices. And he said that I would like to die of an overdose of pleasure. And given the fact that we're living in this age of governmentality, an age of, you know, where we are all um, uh, encouraged to optimize our uh, opportunities, yeah, where sex, desire, pleasure is all very instrumental. Yeah, it's, it, because there is a promise that, you know, uh, how, that desire will give you freedom, that pleasure will, you know, there, is, there, there are no limits. I think this, this, this quote by Foucault is very, very interesting because it's a very, very deep link between transgressive practices and the risk wantings, which we, sh we shouldn't lose sight of in our, because there was, my, my fear was when I uh, present Tantra that it kind, kind of can sound celebratory. And I just wanted to remind everybody how risky it is and how um, and how um, how one flirts with danger when you deviate from what is constructed as normal and natural. Yeah. Uh, thanks to uh, Nikita for uh, looking at the, maybe the historical and the philosophical dimensions of the idea of the order of nature, and Graham for Graham for the the part of the story, really, and the question of aesthetics when it comes to the struggle against this particular law. On the historical point, I'd say that, I mean, Nikita has figured a, a kind of thinking around the entire issue of when we, one of the dominant lines we have in this, in the, within the human rights framework of the way we approach this question is to call this law that alien legacy. The question I think Nikita is raising is, is there something within Indian tradition and culture which allows for this, for this law to be accepted? Why is there some deeper reasons why it survived for a longer for a longer period of time? There's something which is the counterpoint of tantra, which is there in Indian culture, which allows for this law to become a part of the soil of India, as it were. It's not just a Macaulay import. It's something which we own. We own because it's part of our own culture. And maybe the counterpoint she's raising is maybe tantra then becomes an important way to to begin this critique of this notion of the order of nature from within the Indian philosophical tradition itself. And with respect to Graham's point, uh, presentation, again, I thought the, what is so marvelous about the, the, the three stories we saw is really, in a sense, the part of the story. Abina was what a brilliant, brilliant, uh, I know her very well, but how wonderful she was in terms of the way she articulated her own personal story and the kind of challenges it really throws up. And I also thought from the first, uh, the first artist you showed, is that I, and the quotation by Audrey Lord, the question of aesthetics or in the struggle against 377. As lawyers, sometimes we think within the framework of the law. But I think part of the problem which we're realizing very, very strongly, I think from both presentations, is that end of the day, the struggle is not really about the law alone. It's about pe changing people's minds and hearts, about how people view an entire section of humanity. And how you do that is through the power of stories, how you do that is through poetry, how you do that is through art. And that's why, that's why, that's my interest in terms of the entire question of working with working with the council on this point. Maybe I'll just end with um, what, one example of this of, of poetry which came into the struggle. The Supreme Court judgment, as I, as I, as I told you, Vikram said described it poetically as a bad day for non love. And to me, actually, what I found incredibly moving was when we had the first protest after the judgment in Delhi, when there were thousands of people uh, who were gathered there, one of our friends, quoted basically this poem by a black American gay uh, poet, Langston Hughes, in Hindi. Akhil Kati. Yeah, you know that. And so what he said in Hindi, the, I, I'll quote it in English for you. He said, what happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun? Does it run like stinking meat? Or does it explode? And I thought that that was really fantastic. Because here you are, at a moment of the deepest despair, maybe the, more, the deepest angle. And here you have this guy who's making the point that really, it's nothing more than a dream effort. And today in 2017, when we look back on 2013, we can see that it's only a dream effort. Because the struggle in India has reached a definite, definitely a very critical point 
with the Supreme Court coming down very heavily on the judgment, I think we can say with confidence that it will be only a matter of time before this law finally goes. That's really interesting that you mentioned that because, in fact, I interviewed Akil and he told that story and I transcribed it and I invited him to make an interview and he agreed. And then when I was in Delhi, unfortunately, his mother was unwell and couldn't go through with the interview. But it was one of the most moving stories, actually, that I heard. It was particularly this, this, I guess, this kind of intersectional notion that one can look at, um, you know, the situation in Harlem um, through a poem by Langston Hughes and then also relate that to one's own situation. Um, in terms of the question of nature, for me, it wasn't really primary in my thinking. Um, and when I was invited to be part of this project or to make a contribution to the journal, I had to sort of question a little bit how I would address it. Um, and one thing I <clears throat> remembered was this um, text which Foucault talks about from Seneca, who's a, a Stoic philosopher, called Natural Questions. And my, my interest in the text was really to, in a way, escape this kind of... Um, selfish notion of the, the care of the self and to try and kind of think of it in a more relational way, both in terms of the social but also in terms of a kind of idea of ecology. Um, and in this text by Seneca, which, which Foucault quotes quite extensively, he talks about how, <clears throat> he talks about this idea of turning. So first of all, you turn to yourself to repair, remedy, um, emancipate yourself, and then in the second movement you turn to uh, the social sphere to liberate yourself from this idea of a kind of profit motive in your relationship to others. And then in a third move you think about yourself in relation to natural laws, which I guess brings us to this idea of natural laws, which we're all trying to critique and escape and, and, and um, challenge. But the point that Foucault makes, which is quite interesting, which is that uh, for him, in his reading of Stoic philosophy, was that, yes, it does have and can have this, this normative um, effect, but in, in another interpretation, you can also think about it is as a way of reflecting on your own nature and the specificity of your own nature. And in the same text, Seneca talks about this idea of measuring yourself. So measuring yourself analyzing and reflecting on yourself and thinking, you know, what kind, of, what kind of subject am I, including sexuality, but beyond sexuality, and, and how do I then fit into a sort of wider ecology? Um, so I think, that, I think that for me would be the kind of starting point for my address to this notion of uh, what, what are natural laws and how do you think about that? Thank you very much. It's uh, unfortunately very uh, already late, and uh, we were supposed to continue the conversation. I just wanted to um, add a more comment that uh, is maybe the what we will work on together for the for the journal. The the, the problem we had, uh, as I proposed, presented in the beginning, this uh, slide. You know, is this on the top right? This first audience that we try to reach, this group of judges, religious leaders, and politicians, people who, this, these people are really the target of the, of the journal. And you know, the, the story, we, you have seen it in, in many films, in, in many movies, in many stories, you know, the story of, uh, you have a guy who have like a, an ideal who is like working on it all his, all his life, trying to struggle for it, and after like years and years and years of struggling, he is meeting the power person. And he has like five minutes to talk to this person. The question is how this, pers how this person who know very well his struggle and who wants to, 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 to stand for something and say something, how does it talk to this power person to convince him or her of that, that what he says is, is right and is important? Does he use legal argument? Does he say a poem as you were talking about poetry? Does he sing? Does he talk about his own life? Does he speculate on something? There is something very specific in the journal itself about the way we write, the, the, the way we will, the experimental space that we are building, what, what 
how we will write these articles. And of course, it's not a question that we can raise now because it will take like 20 more minutes to talk about it, but that will be basically the discussion we will have with each of the writers from their, their respective perspective and approach. How, as a scholar, you are talking to these people who are not your usual audience. How, as an artist, you are talking to these groups with, who are not your usual audience. So that was like the, maybe the last comment. And we, we can take like the, maybe the last five minutes we have to open to the audience. If someone has question to ask, of course we will continue outside, maybe. But does someone has a question to ask to our speaker today? told that in 30 seconds now there's going to be an announcement asking us to leave the building so uh, it's not that I'm not I'm that I'm glad that you go <laughs> can we talk over the boys now mesdames et messieurs il est bientôt 21 heures le musée ainsi que les expositions vont fermer nous vous prions de bien vouloir regagner la sortie Demain, le centre ainsi que les expositions ouvriront à 11h. Nous vous remercions de votre visite et espérons avoir le plaisir de vous accueillir à nouveau très prochainement. Ladies and gentlemen, the museum and the exhibitions are about to close. We invite you to proceed to the exit. Tomorrow, the center and the exhibition will open at 11. Thank you for the process of producing the journal. Otherwise, I mean, the question that the, 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 the topic that Gregory was introducing, which is basically what is the language that we need to use, what is the shift that we need to produce in our own relationship to, to language and the kind of registers that we use to address uh, legal knowledge, legal experts, will be certainly a uh, question that our speakers today will have in mind, will keep in mind what this is the, the, the contributions to the journal, which is, at the end of the day, question on the very form of uh, the writing and the uh, address that those essays will take. The disconnecting us. I'm truly sorry to interrupt you guys, but if you want to keep talking about that, it's not a problem. I'm just going to have to go down the forum over there to continue the conversation, because we really have three really nice guys. So thank you to everyone. Today.